It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the movies of February 13th, 1998, which was both Valentine's Weekend, President's Day Weekend, overall a four-day weekend where you have six movies here that came out, and uh, let's go ahead and delve into them. We'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and that is Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore in the romantic comedy The Wedding Singer. 1985. Everybody on the dance floor! Robbie Hart was the most popular wedding singer around. Until he got stood up at his own wedding. I realize I'm about to marry a wedding singer? That could have been brought to my attention yesterday! New Line Cinema presents... Is it true that you're in the middle of a nervous breakdown? Who said that? Everybody can say that. Adam Sandler. Get out of my Van Halen t-shirt before you change the band and they break up. And Drew Barrymore. He's so amazingly cute. In a story about finding love where you least expect it. Go get him. Right. Right. Oh, is he insane? He's fine. He's just warming up. You are the worst wedding singer in the world, buddy. Sir, one more outburst. I will strangle you with my microphone wire. <laughs> the Wedding Singer. I said get Keep in mind, this was only Adam Sandler's fourth movie after the three films he did in 95 and 96, Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, and Bulletproof, which were varying successes here or there financially. Critically, not so much. So to have this movie come out and not only be a huge, probably his, big, his biggest hit to this point, but to be a critical success too was really, really something significant for Sandler back then. Uh, this is the story about a wedding singer, played by Sandler in 1985, who falls in love with a waitress, played by Drew Barrymore. And you should see in the trailer, he was supposed to be married to this woman, but she divorces him based on the fact that he's a wedding singer. Which leads to the classic line of, this is something that could have been brought to my attention yesterday! And uh, this is also directed by Frank Caracci, who later directs Sandler in his biggest financial hit to this point, which would be The Waterboy, which would be coming out, in the following, coming out within the, the year. And, um... You know, honestly, you'd expect this movie to be... You know, it's weird, because the more I think about it, Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore have made some pretty good comedies together. I mean, when you really think about some of Adam Sandler's best movies, what do we think about? The Wedding Singer, uh, Fifty First Dates, and then I would say that something like Blended, which is not that great of a movie, but it's better than some of the other movies that Adam Sandler was doing at the time during that time because of the chemistry between him and Drew Barrymore. I mean, their chemistry is so strong. Like you almost want them to be in more movies after this. And, but, um, those are the only three films that they've been involved in. And this is a great movie. You like their chemistry together. I mean, they're both very funny in this movie. They're given a lot to do. The trailers easily make this look like another Adam Sandler movie. But when you watch the movie itself, there is a lot more to it. There is a, a little bit of a charm to it, and it's because of... I think it's mostly because of what Drew Barrymore brings to the table with her, her and Adam Sandler having the chemistry that they have. It's just so strong, and you see three movies together with them where it's just like, you know what? This movie is working because they're so good together. Like, you can almost forget some of the some of the more... the typical Sandler-esque comedy here. But then again, this is still very much early on in his career where it wasn't too big of an annoying factor, and we were still kind of accepting it for what it is. I mean... It's a great movie. It's a really good movie. It's a movie that took me a long time to get into it, too, because I never really had any interest in seeing it, even when I saw Adam Sandler. At, even when I was really watching a lot of Adam Sandler's movies, this is the one I usually stepped away from, but I finally watched it after so many years, and I was really impressed at how much I really enjoyed this movie. It is a very funny comedy. Maybe it's just because it takes place in the 1980s, and I just love the 1980s so much, and maybe that's why it kind of appealed to me so much, but... Or maybe it's just because of what I said before, Sandler and Barrymore, their chemistry just works. And you also have uh, Christine Taylor, Alan Covert, Angela Featherstone, um, uh, Kevin Nealon, uh, John Lovitz is in here as well. I mean, just like, there's just so much to like about this movie. It has a great charm to it. It's funny. A lot of the material works very well. I mean, it's just a really good, fun, romantic comedy. And I mean, it just fits so well. It's had a blasting legacy in the 25 years since it's been released. And it is one of Adam Sandler's best comedies, straightforward comedies. This is one of his best ones and kind of the one that pushed him to a new audience, too, that, had, that hadn't that seen stuff like Bulletproof or Happy Gilmore or Billy Madison. I mean, it's a really funny movie. I really do recommend it. It definitely is one of Adam Sandler's best movies overall. So uh, that's The Wedding Singer. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, The Star-Studded Sphere, based off of Michael Crichton's book, directed by Barry Levinson. 
Warner Brothers presents the movie event of the year. We think there's an unknown life form on this spacecraft. 1,000 feet below. So you're saying the spacecraft crashed 300 years ago? In the most alien environment on Earth. Look at the size of that thing. A new kind of terror. It's reflecting everything but us. Is taking shape. From author Michael Crichton. It's human. You think this is coming from the sphere? It's an American spaceship. It can't be an American spaceship. It's 300 years old. This is a first. You are now online with an alien intelligence. Why won't you answer me? Did you go inside the sphere? He didn't tell you what's inside the sphere, did he? If we made you angry, Dustin Hoffman. That's not me! Sharon Stone. I'm not crazy! Samuel L. Jackson. Are you afraid of dying, Norm? I'm not gonna die here. I'm not going to lie, when I first saw the trailers for this movie back in the day, I thought this was a sequel to Outbreak because it looked like it, it looked literally like the same people from the same characters from Outbreak, just in a different setting. And this time they didn't have to deal with a monkey, they had to deal with the sea creature. And that's pretty much what the plot is, that's pretty much what the plot is about, the latter half, not the part about Outbreak. This has nothing to do with the movie Outbreak, which I did not like this movie, but I at least see more value in it than I do with this film. This is this is a mess of a film. This film takes place 1,000 feet below the ocean. You have these Navy divers discovering an object half a mile long. A crack team of scientists are deployed to the site in deep sea habitats where they what they find boggles the mind as they discover a perfect metal spear. And what's the secret behind the spear? Will they survive the mysterious manifestations? Who or what is creating these? They may never live to find out. And, um... It's a time. Tra it's a mix between. A t it's a time travel movie. It's like someone took the concept of Cocoon, and basically said, "Let's make it into a sci-fi movie." And Barry Levinson, come on. To is I mean, I know we just made Wag the Dog, but we need you to make this movie, man. It's just like, and it's. W and I completely forgot that the he directed this movie because he also did Wag the Dog, not but two months prior to this, which was a far superior movie. But this. This is a mess. This is a mess that has been seen way too many times. I mean, it's like a mix between Cocoon and The Abyss, and it doesn't help that you have the writer of the writer of Equilibrium, Kurt Rimmer, and also the man who gave us the the infamous classic Ultraviolet during the writing for this. This was actually his first script he ever wrote, and um, kind of an indication of his career going forward. And I don't really know if this movie could have had a whole lot to make it a movie that would have been a big, big success. I mean. Despite the fact that you have a pretty solid cast overall, Dustin Hoffman, Sharon Stone, Samuel Jackson, you see Lee Schreiber in there, Peter Coyote, Queen Latifah, Huey Lewis has a cameo in this movie as a helicopter pilot. I mean, I mean, it's a strong cast overall, but just a not an interesting story. It's like a mix of Cocoon meets the Abyss, except let's add in a little bit of an alien element to it as well. Plus, it's one of those movies that had an extravagant budget for the day, $80 million. I mean, remember the days when $80 million seemed like an incredible amount of money to spend on a movie, not like the $300 million misfires that we've had so far this summer? Uh, needless to say, it did not make that money back whatsoever. Like, it almost, like it made only $37 million here and just $73 million worldwide is in total. Like, it didn't even make back its budget back. That That's depressing for a film that has this caliber of stars. Is based off of a Michael Crichton book and is directed by the same man that gave us Rain Man and Wag the Dog. I mean, that is... That's a new low to step into. That's not a good... Is, that's a, not a good thing to go into with a film like this. And it just doesn't work. It's a movie... It's, what, it's basically following the same problems that most mainly original sci-fi films try to do. They try to create something that's very unique and very ahead of the time, but they're just, but they, it said they have to rip, but they have to keep ripping off other far better things to make it happen. I mean, we've seen this so many times with stuff like Transcendence and Reminisce and like all these, Lucy, all these really bad sci-fi films that we've gotten over the last couple of decades that try to be original and unique while trying to take from other material, but taking stuff that's not working on any level necessary. It's just like, it just doesn't work. It's a movie that just doesn't work on any level. You can see why Warner Brothers dumped it out there. They knew it was bad. They had to get it the hell out of here. So, Spear was not a great film. Uh, let's see if we can turn the tide around with our next movie, and that is John Goodman and the adaptation of The Borrowers. In every city, in every house, unseen, unsuspected, they borrow our possessions. They watch our every move. Now, it's time to see the world 
through the eyes of the borrowers. Amazing. Tiny little people. But one man. Ta-da! 24 luxury apartments in the place of one house. He's out to destroy their home. I want this house flattened, and I want it flattened today! And he's about to discover... Those little rats stole something very important from me. <laughs> and nobody steals from Osha's pea powder. <laughs> that big... Any last words? ...isn't always better. From the author of Bed Knobs and Broomsticks comes an adventure for people of all sizes. I'm gonna borrow you. It's February. Hold on to your hat. Small. And no line, Berman! Wait, wait! Is awesome. John Goodman. I hate you little people. Oh, that's a shame. We love you. The Borrowers. So this is actually the fourth adaptation of The Borrowers based off the book by Mary Norton. There was actually one that was made in 1973 for NBC. There was a couple of made-for-TV sequels in the 90s. Made-for-TV movies, I should say. One was a, one was a 1992 movie that was made for TNT, and then there was a sequel made for, in 93. And this is actually the fourth of actually six different versions because there was also The Secret World of Arietti, which was a Hayao Miyazaki movie that came out in Japan in 2010 and then in, in America in 2012. And then there was another version of The Borrowers came out in 2011, which starred Christopher Eccleston and Stephen Fry. This is the one that we're the one we're looking at here is directed by the man who, unfortunately, his career kind of faltered big time after this, Peter Hewitt. We talked about a couple of his movies before. Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, which was a fun little movie. Then there was Tom and Huck, which was not that great. And then he follows this up with stuff like the Garfield movie, the one with Bill Murray, which... It's a bad film, but I kind of have a little bit of appreciation for it because of Bill Murray as Garfield, even though it's not as funny as it should be. I have a little bit of a soft spot for that film. Zoom, one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Tim Allen in a really bad X-Men for kids type clone film. And then he also did Home Alone, The Holiday Heist, which was a bad Home Alone sequel. But, um... But uh, in this movie, you have basically the same kind of concept here. John Goodman plays the the lawyer who's out to destroy the house. Um, and you also have Jim Broadbent, Mark Williams, uh, um, Bradley Pierce, just these, and uh, Tom Felton as the borrowers themselves. And, you know, I gotta say, I did not know if this movie was gonna hold up after 25 years, but watching it again, I actually kind of like this movie. I do like that the, the effects in the movie still hold up pretty well here. I think John Goodman's having a good time in this movie. He's actually playing a better role in this film than he did in Blues Brothers 2000, which we just talked about in the last episode. And like I said, the, the effects in this movie still hold up pretty well here. I mean, it feels like it's the same... It has a similar feel and flow to something like Mouse Hunt. It feels like... It, like even though this is not the, technically the same studio behind Mouse Hunt, it felt like it was made by the same people and the same visual effects people. And the worlds they create here are really, really impressive. This is a story that actually works really, really well here. The comedy in here works very well here. You do like the family in here. It is a fun little movie. It's a film that didn't really get a whole lot of attention, mostly because it was a kid's film opening in February, but it's a surprisingly enjoyable film. I would actually say d definitely give it a shot. I mean, I definitely recommend it. It's a film that's kind of very underrated, but it's a really solid adaptation of the story. It has a great cast, a great visual feel to it, some great humor, some great storytelling. It's a really enjoyable film. I highly recommend checking it out. It's actually worth it more than you would think it would be. Definitely check this one out. I'd recommend The Borrowers he very much. So, um, that said, on to the next movie, Hurricane Streets. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought for a second I already covered this movie. I thought I had a. I think I want to have. I think what happened was I had it on a list of the 1997 leftovers from a couple weeks ago, and I thought I think I had it on there, but I didn't cover it. And um, I'm kind of glad I didn't now because now it's out this weekend. Even though there there wasn't really much I can add to this, but we'll go ahead and talk, briefly mention this. Uh, Brandon Sexton the Third from Welcome to the Dollhouse plays this New York City street kid named Marcus who's conflicted between running a gang who wants to move up in more serious crimes and a girl he meets who tries to steer him clear from a potential life in prison. 
And um, in addition to him, you've got uh, Heather on the Mazo in this film, as well as um, Kit Car- Ellen Kit Carson and Edie Falco, pre-Sopranos. And um, like I said, I really have not seen this movie, so even if I had talked about it beforehand, it probably wouldn't have been that, that quickly. But, but um, it looks like it's, it doesn't look too bad. It's got some pretty good reviews on it, and uh, 88% are Rotten Tomatoes from the Rotten Tomato reviews they collected. And, and um, yeah. I mean, it doesn't look like a bad film, honestly. It does look like a film that could have some potential there. But uh, like I said, I haven't seen the movie, so I can't really say if it's any good or not. So, uh, either way, if I had covered this a couple weeks before, I'd probably be telling you the same thing. I'd more than be telling you the same thing, actually. So, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie. That is And Rand, A Sense of Life. So this is a documentary in which Sharon Glass from Cagney and Lacey narrates the story of Rand's life and her overview of her ideas. In addition to color and archival black and white footage of Rand, the film includes uh, people like Harry Binswagger and Leonard Peikoff, CBS News' Mike Wallace, Phil Donahue, Tom Snyder, Frank Lord Wright, Joseph Stalin, Leon Trotsky, Cecil B. DeMille, Edith Head, Adolf Adolf Menjou, Marilyn Monroe, Robert Taylor, and basically, it's covering the person that gave us stuff like the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, and and while her and uh, you know, Anne Rand's Atlas Shrugged story, movies stories have been made into movies, not great films. I mean, they're terrible movies, no matter who you talk to and no matter who you believe about the story. But um, but as far as this goes, I don't know anything. To, I don't know really too much about this one. I've never seen it. I never really had a real interest in learning about Anne Rand, quite honestly, and. Um, I don't know. The documentary's got some decent reviews to it, but it doesn't look like it's anything too spectacular. It did get nominated for the Oscar for Best Documentary Film, but lost to The Long Way Home, which is a film we've covered before. And, uh... And I'm trying to see if there's anything interesting about this movie I can talk about that hasn't already been said. No, not really. I mean, I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know what else to say about it, honestly, but, um... I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it delivers what it, what the people want to see about about Anne Rand's life. But like I said, I have no real interest in learning about her personally. But um, so that's Anne Rand's sense of life. So let's go ahead and move on to the last film we have here, and that is the Bugs Bunny Film Festival. Okay, technically there wasn't even a trailer for this. There were no videos online for the actual thing for this. But um, I wanted to cover this anyway because this is a pretty interesting thing they did. I think they did this for the Warner Brothers 75th anniversary. And what you have here is essentially two movies uh, smashed together of various shorts. You have cartoon, you have a mix of modern and new sh- classic shorts. Like You get stuff like Another Froggy Evening and Birdie and the Beast, Bugs Bunny Rides Again, Rabbit Seasoning, Feed the Kitty, Duck Amuck, Fast and Furi- Furious, One Froggy Evening, What's Opera Doc, Alibaba Bunny, Nighty Night Bugs, High Diving Hair, Bully for Bugs, Rabbit of Seville, What's Cooking Doc, Tortoise Wins by a Hair, Hair Raising Hair, just all these different Bugs Bunny cartoons and various other cartoons as well. This is an over three hour movie that was in theater, one theater for one whole, for almost a full year, 46 weeks. It opened to a $12,000 opening, but it made over, made over $400,000. Um, which basically just goes to show you that people still love the Looney Tunes, and really, there's nothing more I can really add to this movie per se, because I've seen all these shorts, they're very funny shorts, they're all well done. I just like the idea of them being on the big screen again, and everybody just coming to see these movies, and sitting there for three hours just watching them and enjoying some classic Looney Tunes cartoons, and... I mean, really, what more do I gotta say about it, man? I mean, this is just something that I really wish I would have been a, I would have been a a little bit older to go see by myself or actually had a theater that had played this because this is definitely something that I would have easily gone out to see on my own. Like, this is something I really, really would have loved to see in theaters. And, um, and, uh, yeah, like, like I said, there's nothing really too spectacular about that, but this particular release except the fact that it's over three hours of Looney Tunes cartoons on the big screen and I really would have loved to see it back then. I really would like to see them put these cartoons back on the big screen once again and let us see these for what they let us see them on the big screen again, but I don't know if we're ever going to have that happen again, but um look like a ton of fun. it does look like a ton of fun though seeing all these cartoons together in one big event. Um 
that's pretty much all I got to say about that one. That's the Bugs Bunny Film Festival. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. When we meet next time, we'll take a look at the seven films released on February 20th, including uh, Marlon Wayans and David Spade and Senseless. We also have Palmetto, Dangerous Beauty, Mrs. Dalloway, I Love You, Don't Touch Me, Comrades, Almost a Love Story, and The Break. So seven movies to look at next time around. We'll delve into those on the next episode. But until then, uh, thank you very much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And also, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button to see more videos like this. So with that said, I will see you guys next time for another episode. So thanks for watching. Until then, take care.